Some of what we will be going over in this lecture will be review for some of you. If you have had a undergraduate evolution class before, um, you may have gone over this. We may probably will do it in a little bit more detail and it'll be a good refresher for you even if you have had it. So when we're looking at populations, one of the most common types of traits that we see are continuous traits. These are things like size uh, in most populations. Um, in humans, for instance, there's a very small percentage of people who are very short. There's a very small percentage of people who are very tall. Most people fall somewhere in the middle. So we kind of get this normal distribution if we're looking at total number of phenotypes. And there are no discrete classes. So you don't have either tall or medium or short. You have everything from both extremes in between. Okay, So I've got three different uh, treatments of the same population here. So in generation number one, we have the same distribution of traits across the population. The arrow here represents individuals that are selected against. So in this example, individuals that are very short, for instance, or whatever trait this is, individuals at this extreme just don't do well. They don't reproduce as much, they maybe don't survive as well, and so their phenotypes are not represented as much in the next generation. Now, we're assuming that this phenotype has some genetic component, maybe even mostly genetic. And if we were talking about something like height in humans, that's a good statement, right? Most of our height comes from our genes, although in extreme circumstances, our environment may play a role also. So if we were to uh, have strong selection against short individuals, then over time, the population would shift. We would still have some short individuals, although the extreme may not be as pronounced. But on average, individuals would get taller over time. This is actually a trend that we have seen in the human population. If we go back several hundred years, on average, people were shorter in many populations. Um, of course, maybe if we looked at an individual smaller population, we might see a reversal of that. But in many populations, individuals have gotten larger. Some of that may be due to environment because overall we have better nutrition, uh, fewer extreme uh, phenotypes uh, induced by environment. But there's probably been some selection for taller uh, genes also. So we call this directional selection. Now the key to directional selection is it can go either way, right? We looked at, um, or one of the famous examples of this are Darwin's finches, where there was a drought and finches got larger because there were only larger seeds available as food. But if smaller seeds become available, then it could shift the other way. So directional selection goes either way depending on which side of the distribution does well and which side of the distribution does poorly. In our second example here, we have selection on both of the extremes. The short individuals don't do well, the tall individuals don't do well, and so what we end up with is something that we're going to call stabilizing selection. Uh, sometimes it's also called balancing selection. We'll use the term stabilizing. But in stabilizing selection, what we end up with is loss of the extremes and more individuals in the middle. And this actually may be a better, it might actually be a little bit better if the um, distribution went up a little bit, because if the environment can still support the same number of individuals, we would have more individuals in the middle. And so this normal curve should probably be a little bit taller. This assumes that, you know, we've actually, the population size has become reduced, which, which may happen. That shows a population under some sort of pressure. If it's not really under pressure, if just these individuals on either side don't do well, we'd see the same overall number under the curve, but the curve would be higher here in the middle. Okay, so stabilizing selection. The third type that we're going to talk about is called, th the book that I took this image from um, called it disrupting or disruptive selection. Diversifying is a little bit more common. We'll use the term diversifying selection, but you may see disruptive also. And in diversifying selection, the individuals in the middle just don't do well. Now recognize this usually represents a change in the environment because if that, if that pressure against those individuals had been there all along, we wouldn't see this normal distribution with most individuals having the, the negative phenotype. Okay, but what we end up with is kind of this bimodal distribution where we have a lot of individuals that on, on either side and few individuals in the middle. And you should recognize that it's the, if this diversifying selection goes on, eventually we're going to subdivide the population into two distinct subpopulations based on this trait. And especially if there's some reinforcement of that, maybe a mating bias or uh, maybe some sort of geographic barrier between the two individuals or other sort of barrier, this could be the steps towards speciation. But if these two subpopulations can continue to interbreed, then we'll eventually reach kind of a point where we end up with this bimodal distribution in every generation remove 
the individuals in the middle. Now, there are two allele versions of all three of these. For the first one, we're going to call it the same thing. We'll call it directional selection. Okay, and again, remember it could go either way, but in the two allele version, we are going to reduce one of the allele frequencies in the population and increase the other allele frequency. And so that's going to have an impact on the genotypes also. Now recognize with directional selection, depending on the force of the selection, depending on the genetics, whether it's codominance or, or incomplete dominance or, or um, uh, just a, 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 a simple dominant recessive trait, whatever that is, they're going to have varying impact on this. But the long-term outcome, if this persists, is we would reduce and probably eventually eliminate the allele that is being selected against and we would get fixation of the other allele. So soon, only individuals that were big A, big A would be present in the environment. Okay, so that's directional selection at the two allele version. When we're looking at the two allele version for uh, what uh, is similar to stabilizing selection, we call it overdominance. Uh, the classic example of this is um, malaria and sickle cell anemia trait, where the heterozygotes do better when malaria is present than either of the homozygotes. Now, the key to this is that you can't make a heterozygote without having some of either homozygotes in the population. And so what usually ends up happening, depending on the various forces of selection, is we reach a balance point. This is one reason why it's called st uh, stabilizing selection in the continuous form. But overdominance, the way I remember it, is you kind of make a hill in the middle. You have to go over the hill. If that helps you remember it, great. But we end up with this intermediate phenotype, the heterozygote here, being the most common. So it's analogous to uh, this one here. And then finally, the third type that you should be familiar with is the two allele version of this diversifying selection. And when that occurs, we end up with a reduction or a loss of the heterozygote, and both of the homozygotes become more common. Now, I've drawn it here equal, so they're both going up from what the original uh, population was, but it can be unequal too. We could have a little bit more on one side and a little less on this side, but still it's better than the heterozygote. So this is called underdominance. And underdominance, just like disruptive selection, can divide the population into two distinct classes. And again, with some reinforcement, either geographic or behavioral of some sort, we could get two completely separate populations, and this could be the beginning of a speciation event. Okay, so be familiar with these three forms of selection in the uh, continuous traits, and then their analogs in the two allele versions. Now, these are for populations, and so it's a new, nice way to do and, and evaluate populations, but realize that um, we may be missing, particularly with the continuous trait and only evaluating the phenotypes, we might be missing a lot of the underlying trends and diversity that's going on at the DNA level. And so with our modern uh, DNA sequencing ability and our larger and larger data sets, we can do some really useful and nice analyses uh, with those data sets and looking at all of the diversity, not just natural selection, but mutations, maybe even the effects of genetic drift and kind of a compensating or allowing for that with big enough data sets. But certainly we can, uh, we can integrate mutations and natural selection and find what their influence is on the genome. So we're going to look at two examples here, and then we'll extend that to some other non-gene, non-coding examples in the next lecture. So to find whether or not there is natural selection acting on genes, one of the most common methodologies is the Ka to Ks ratio or the DNDS ratio. So let me talk, just I'll give you an example about what makes these different. From now on, we'll just use the DNDS ratio. Sometimes it makes a difference, other times it's just a minor correction, but here's the difference, okay? The Ka to Ks ratio is the unadjusted ratio, and basically what we do is we measure all of the non-synonymous mutations, so the mutations that change an amino acid, versus all of the synonymous mutations, and we make a ratio. The DNDS is a corrected version of the Ka to Ks ratio, and so with the DNDS ratio, we correct for the number of possible non-synonymous and the number of possible synonymous mutations, which can be a complicated thing, and we won't get into how that's done mathematically or um, algorithmically, but just know it's a corrected version. So let me give you an example. Let's say I came to you and said, oh, look, I've counted all of um, the voters in my survey sample, and I have found that um, 100 of the women in my, in my sample are going to vote for candidate A, 
and 100 of the men are going to vote for candidate A. Therefore, I determine that there's no difference between um, the sexes in who they're going to vote for. Now, that sounds good on the surface, but realize it might not be a valid assumption if I have um, some biased or unbalanced data to begin with. So if I asked 200 men and 500 women, and I had 100 men versus 100 women, that's not the same thing, right? I've had half of my men who are going to vote for the candidate, but only 20% of the women. And so we would need to adjust for the beginning numbers in our original sample size. And so, again, it's a more complicated adjustment, but we adjust for the overall possible non-synonymous versus synonymous, and that's going to depend on what amino acids we're looking, to, looking at and what changes. Might even involve mapping those changes onto a phylogeny if we've got more than, than two populations that we're comparing between. Okay? And so the only way to, to have a Ka to Ks ratio is if we're comp comparing two or more sequences. Okay? So our null hypothesis for the Ka to Ks ratio is going to be um, neutrality. Okay? So we are going to assume that if there's no natural selection, then this value, the DNDS ratio value, will be approximately one, not significantly different from one. Okay? So that's the first, and that's kind of our null hypothesis, that under neutral uh, selection, we would not see a sig significant variation from one. So look over here. And this is, we don't have any of the quantitative numbers here, but you can kind of get a, a good feeling for it based on the graphs. So this is a number of different genes. The black bar here represents the non-synonymous mutations. The white bar represents the synonymous mutations. So in interleukin-6, it looks like we have close to neutral evolution. We'd like those bars to be exactly the same for complete neutrality, but maybe it's close. We'd have to do some statistical tests to see if this is a significant difference. But that's close to neutral selection. But as we go farther and farther and farther along, our non-synonymous mutations become fewer and fewer. And these are ranked this way so you can see the trend. And our synonymous mutations re remain relatively unchanged. There's some variation, some more, some less, but those remain relatively unchanged. So the farther we go down on this graph, the more we are getting a form of selection that is called negative or sometimes purifying selection. So we'll call this negative selection. And what we mean by negative selection is simply that when a mutation occurs, if it changes the amino acid sequence, odds are it's going to be removed by natural selection. So this means down here in the, this range, these genes are doing very important jobs. And there's not a lot of flexibility in how they do that job because when a mutation results in a change in the amino acid, natural selection removes it. Now, mutations that are neutral are not impacted by natural selection. So for instance, CCC, that codon, codes for proline. If I change that third position, CCA, it is a synonymous mutation and it still codes for proline. And so there is going to be no force of natural selection removing CCA variants from the population versus CCC uh, variants. And so over time, some of those are going to um, accumulate. We may even get fixation just due to genetic drift. But there's going to be no trend and no force. And so genes that are performing very, very important functions and have a limited number of, a little bit limited amount of flexibility in how they can perform that function are those variants uh, are selected against, and we end up with this very strong negative selection. Oh, I just noticed a typo. Sorry, let me fix this. This should have been little d n. Won't let me make a, or maybe I have my caps lock on, sorry. There we go. This is the proper way. This is typically the way it, it would be shown. Okay, so that DNDS ratio is um, it is constrained. Um, what would we expect the DNDS be to be very constrained? Now, when I say constrained, I mean its function doesn't vary over time. That shows you it's a very important gene, and there's not a lot of flexibility. And so this is called negative or purifying selection. Now, recognize that this ratio would be less than one, right? Because if our synonymous mutations, which aren't really impacted under natural selection, that would remain the same, but we have very, very few number, few of the non-synonymous mutations that are kept. So this is a very small number, this is a very large number, and when we have a ratio like that, that means a, a value that's less than one, right? So with negative selection, we would expect this Ka to Ks ratio to be significant, I'm sorry, the Dn to Ds ratio. We would expect this to be um, significantly less than one, and let's go ahead and put that in here. 
that value, and I'm going to have to change the, um, and we'll just put two of them, but significantly less than one. Okay. So that is negative selection. Again, this only works in coding sequences because there's no such thing as a synonymous versus a non-synonymous mutation in a non-coding sequence. There can be sequences that are beneficial versus negative, but we don't have a coding sequence, so there's no um, synonyms, there's no um, degeneracy involved because we're not in a coding region. Okay? And then we have a third possibility that you need to know. So when the, and again, let's just, so we're just so we're consistent here, I didn't change these before. Well, let's do the same thing. We'll use the adjusted version again. For our purposes, they're going to be roughly equivalent. Okay, but the NDS ratio under positive selection. Now, in this diagram here, we don't have any genes that are under positive selection. This would uh, imply that the black bar, the non-synonymous mutations, are higher than the synonymous mutations. So under positive selection means the gene is probably important in one or more lineages, maybe only in one, and that in one of the, or more of those lineages, it has evolved and mutated, and those mutations have been kept, and it's taken on a brand new function. Okay, So that is the um, trend that we see on when genes are under positive selection. So the take-home message here is that this ratio, the DNDS, in fact, let's just it'd be easier for me to cut it from here. When we see strong positive selection, which means an important gene that's taken on a new function, maybe even a gene that um, determines um, the difference between these two species, in this case, that number would be significantly higher than one. Okay, and so if we see that ratio, it's higher. It's it's a sure sign that that gene is under positive selection. Now, if we have to look at all of the homologous gene pairs we can find, and we're going to do orthologous pairs. But if we have to look at all of those orthologous gene pairs between two species, probably for a majority of genes, we're going to find that they've been under purifying selection. We would find maybe some that are evolving neutrally, but that's not real common for genes. Genes usually serve a, an important purpose, and so they really are under some sort of constraint and can't evolve neutrally. Either, either they are under constraint to remain the same, or they uh, evolve to take on new function in different species. And if I was examining us two different species and looking for uh, examples of genes that might have differentiated them, that might have been under selection and create some of the differences between those two species, I would be looking for genes that show a DNDS ratio significantly greater than one. So it becomes a powerful tool. And not only can we just do it like in an alignment, so let me show you, I've got an alignment here. Uh, that I have pulled out using MEGA. So here I've got an alignment, and notice there are lots of changes at the DNA level. Okay, But when I look at this same uh, DNA sequence for these four different flies, when I look at it translated into a protein sequence, I see only a very few changes. So this would be a good example of a gene. We'd have to count up all the numbers. But a gene that's under strong uh, purifying or negative selection, right? because any of the mutations... Um, that changed the amino acid have been removed by natural selection. And that's an important point I, I want to emphasize is um, we're not saying that there aren't uh, mutations that change the amino acid that occur. They're still occurring all the time at, at equal rates. The rate of mutation and the randomness of mutations has not changed. But the forces of natural selection on those random mutations then generates a pattern that is very clear and can be measured in these values. And so we're just measuring them across four different species. We could do pairwise comparison or generalize across the entire group of organisms, saying whether there's been positive or negative selection. Or we could even take this one step farther, right? So I could generate a phylogeny for these species, right? And then look at selective straight over constraint over time by mapping where the changes occurred. And we re remember we did that in the first part of this class. If I were to map all of those changes onto a phylogeny and then determine whether they were uh, non-synonymous or synonymous changes that had occurred, I could uh, generate a KDN to DS ratio for every single branch on the tree. So once I've mapped those DN-DS ratios onto the phylogeny, and again, K to KS is roughly equivalent. We won't bother changing it here. But I could then locate regions of the tree, and maybe what I would find is that in one branch there had been strong positive selection, 
maybe across all the species or a handful, and in the rest of it, it had been evolving under a purifying selection mode. And so it's a powerful tool, not only just for raw DNA data, but if I add in the background foundation, the roadmap, if you will, of a phylogeny, suddenly I gain extra ability to do analyses. And this has actually been done many, many times. Here's just one example on the human immunodeficiency virus. It uh, evolved from a virus that was common to um, hominids, uh, the simian immunodeficiency virus, probably uh, jumped over through uh, the use of bushmeat and not being careful while we're butchering animals and so blood-to-blood -blood contact. Anyway, um, and in fact, there are two unique instances of introduction. They appear to be fairly close to one another, um, and it's kind of an interesting um, historical story of how that happened. But um, two unique uh, instances where this uh, virus in uh, uh, other hominids jumped into humans. So HIV-2, HIV-1, they have slightly different um, epidemiologies and virulence and things like that. But what we see, which is not an unusual thing, is that there is evidence for strong positive selection after it jumps over into the humans. And that's a very common thing and, and may actually, and probably is to some extent, although it's a very short time period, is probably occurring in the coronavirus. Right? And this really shouldn't scare you. In fact, it's actually probably a good thing. But when we have zoonotic transmission, right, which is a bacteria or a virus or some other infectious agent that is able to jump from one species to another, that's zo zoonosis, kind of a big scary word. But the coronavirus is zoonotically transmitted to us, probably from bats, maybe through pangolins. There's still a little bit of doubt about that. But certainly from another species, when it jumps into humans, kind of all bets are off. And most of the time when humans are exposed to a foreign virus, it either has no virulence at all, it can't even infect cells, or it's just kind of mildly variant, and we don't really even notice those often or even worry about them much. But every once in a while, in all these viral exposures from different species, we get one because it has not evolved with human immune systems, it's a little bit more dangerous, or sometimes a lot more dangerous, right? Like Ebola virus. Um, but the coronavirus is a little bit more dangerous. Uh, uh, maybe I guess you might argue about that if you looked at the impact on our uh, economy and, and way of life over the last six, seven months. But uh, the good thing is, is once it gets in the human population, there's usually then some natural selection. And the natural selection often, if a, viol if a virus is very, very virulent, the natural selection force over time is to reduce the overall vir virulence to a manageable form. And that's because the most fit phenotype for most viruses is that they make their hosts a little bit sick, but they don't kill their host. They don't make them violently sick because that is not long-term a very successful strategy. So as mutations occur that reduce, reduce vir virulence, natural selection will take over and increase the frequency of those reduced virulent uh, strains. And so what will end up happening is we get reduction of virulence. Uh, by the way, the, the, and this, then maybe this is the part that's scary, right? There are two outcomes to a virus that jumps into a new species and is incredibly virulent. Either it sweeps through the entire population and wipes it out, which means the virus is going to die also, at least in that population. Um, or it um, adapts and reaches kind of a truce, if you will, the flu virus is kind of that way, and it's that, I'm not saying it, it's not dangerous. It still is dangerous and sometimes mutates in, a, in the opposite direction, and then natural selection removes those. So Ebola, for instance, is so virulent um, that it really doesn't have the chance to evolve and become more of a common um, disease in humans because uh, you know it just kind of sweeps the population. Everyone freaks out, quarantines, or runs away, and eventually it, it, it dies out in that population. Um, so anyway, this is, is a, something that we see very, very commonly in diseases, but we can see it in other genes also that are under um, evolutionary pressures. Okay, the second um, gene version of a test that we're going to talk about is called the mcdonald kreitman test. And the mcdonald kreitman test relies also on comparison of sequence between species, but in addition, we need in at least one or maybe in both, ideally, we need samples across the population. So in this diagram, I've drawn little uh, multi-pointed stars representing mutations. Maybe red is non-synonymous uh, and um, yellow are synonymous. And then the five-pointed stars here represent uh, mutations, uh, polymorphisms within a single species. And so basically what we do is we calculate a DNDS ratio between the species, and then we calculate the same value. Here we're going to call it a PNPS ratio. So population, non-synonymous versus synonymous. 
we calculate that um, within the species. And the result is as if it's evolving neutrally, is we would expect these ratios to be roughly equal, not significantly different from one another. And so if that's the case, then the gene has evolving been evolving neutrally and it's not really important, doesn't play a role in either species. Now, if these numbers are not the same, they're significantly different from one another, then suddenly, boom, we have a um, good bit of data, evidence, that this gene has been under selection. Now, the type of selection may vary, so let's look at the possibilities, right? So if we had very strong purifying selection within uh, the species so that the gene was important but couldn't vary much in dolphins, then we would expect um, this DNDS ratio, I'm sorry, the PN to PS ratio, right, the, the ratio within the population to be very, very small. And if it had been free to evolve in the past and had accumulated a number of mutations, then that would be larger. And so if they were different, then we would maybe see some sort of neutral evolution versus purifying solution. If the ratio was extreme, then maybe we'd say, oh, maybe there's positive solution, solution positive selection historically, but that more recently in the dolphin population, there has been negative or purifying selection. Okay, so just be aware of those differences and how differences in these ratios might indicate different types of natural selection. And that is the McDonald-Kreitman test.